No, 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 no. Oh. 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 So, um, so I'm, I'm Colin Shepherd. I actually, as you can see from here, my, my uh, pre present affiliation is in Italy. Uh, I'm at the Italian Institute of Technology, uh, and I've been there for four years. Uh, so I, I'm in a uh, it's called the Nanoscopy Group, uh, and it's headed up by uh, Alberto Diaspora. Some of you might know Alberto Diaspora. Uh, so uh, one of the big specialities of, of our group is, uh, is uh, super resolution microscopy uh, and especially they do a lot on, on STED. Uh, I'm going to touch into STED later on but I'm, uh, um, I'm going to start with some more basic uh, microscopy in the first lecture uh, and, uh, and then carry on from there. So I've called this microscope imaging. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so this is a nice, uh, very modern microscope, as you can see. Uh, beautiful old brass one. Uh, and uh, so, what, 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 what constitutes a, a microscope? Well, basically, uh, you can think of it really as being made up of three parts. Uh, there's the uh, objective lens, which actually produces <coughs> the image of your uh, uh, object. Uh, and then an eyepiece, and this is a traditional microscope, right? So it's got an eyepiece and you look down it uh, and, and you see an image, um, a virtual image um, with, through the eyepiece. Uh, and, then, and then it's got some sort of illumination system, which is basically a condenser lens usually. Uh, actually this system here, you see that uh, this has got a mirror here that collects light. Uh, from some ambient light source and uses it to illuminate the sample. Uh, anyway, that's, that's the basic structure of the microscope. Uh, the, really, the, I guess the most important part is the objective lens. That's why I put it first. And, um, you know, you can pay a lot of money for your objective lens. Um, there was someone um, in our lab recently who, who, who bought a, a long, work, long working distance Olympus lens. Uh, it cost uh, 35,000 euros for what, just one lens, so a lot of money for a lens. And um, yeah, uh, you, you probably know that the most uh, important uh, property of the objective lens is the numerical aperture. It's the numerical aperture, uh, which is, um, I'll come on to this later, the product of the refractive index and the, and the semi uh, sign of the semi-angular aperture of the lens. determines uh, the resolution you can get from that lens. Uh, and um, if, here there's a few points. Um, you know, when you use an objective lens, you have to make sure you use the correct one and use it correctly. And uh, you'll find that, uh, that the objective lens normally has uh, some writing on it. It says something like this, uh, which tells you the magnification, the numerical aperture, uh, what the immersion fluid is, which might be uh, air or oil or water or whatever. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, th this is the thickness of the cover slip that you use it with. Uh, and, uh, and this is the, what's called the tube length. Nowadays most, most objectives are infinity tube length, which means that they basically collimate the, the light from the sample is collimated into a parallel beam. Um, so that's quite a recent change, uh, well, I've been in it a long, in, the, in this business for a long time, so I, I can see it as a change. Uh, but maybe 20 years ago, uh, you, you, you would have seen lots of different figures there because people 
the different manufacturers made lenses which focused the light at a different distance from the, from the lens. Uh, the, the condenser lens, uh, you've got a condenser, uh, and in general that will have, you'll be able to uh, control of, for, for the illumination system the aperture of the condenser, and I'm going to say a bit about that in a minute, uh, which is uh, called the, uh, the diaphragm. Uh, and um, but also normally you can control the the, uh, the field that's illuminated. So this is controlled by the field stop. Uh, so you've got control over both those things independently. Okay, now so um, you know the, 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 this is uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the resolution of the microscope. And um, so the simplest thing you can look at is a a, a, a single. A uh, bright spot. Let, let, let's imagine you look at a point of light uh, in your microscope, uh, and uh, the image you will get uh, from that point of light, uh, that point object, uh, is going to be uh, this thing that's called the, the airy disk. Uh, and uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, you get this ring structure because of, uh, of diffraction effects, uh, and uh, um, so that's been known, of course, for a very long time, I guess since Airy. Uh, he was in 1830, I think, he published his paper uh, where he described uh, this, um, this structure. Uh, and uh, if you do a cross-section through this, this, this picture was taken from Vaughan and Wolf. Uh, a cross-section through that uh, looks like this. Uh, so th this is a cross-section through the, the Airy disk. You see that it's got a a central lobe and a series of outer rings. Uh, actually, uh, th this this is rather over accentuated the strength of these outer rings, um, but by, because it's rather o overexposed. But you see that they're not actually that strong. This, the second one doesn't even really appear on this because it's too weak to see. Uh, but the first one uh, has got a strength of about 1.75 percent relative to the, uh, the peak. Uh, and um, you can describe this curve uh, mathematically uh, in terms of uh, Bessel function. And uh, for people who might be f frightened of Bessel functions, they're actually just really like, you know, sines and cosines, uh, decaying sines and cosines, but distorted a bit. Uh, and um, so the amplitude, uh, we can write it in this sort of form, in terms of this Bessel function J1. Uh, and um, uh, this, this argument here, V, uh, is what's called the optical coordinate. This is a thing that I think was probably introduced in Born and Wolf. Uh, and it's like a sort of normalised distance, normalised radius, uh, which allows us to use this same, this same curve to describe uh, any, any microscope objective, whatever the numerical aperture and whatever the wavelength, right? So it's a normalised quantity. Uh, which depends on the wavelength, uh, the refractive index, and the uh, aperture of the lens. Okay, so so any any microscope objective will be approximately anyway described by the, this sort of form. Uh, interestingly, it's called the Airy disk. Uh, if you look in Airy's paper from 1830 or whenever, uh, he calculated this then. Uh, but he didn't call this a Bessel function because uh, he was actually before Bessel. So he had to invent these functions himself uh, in that paper. Right, now very often uh, we describe uh, resolution in terms of what's called the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, we, we look at not one point but two points. Uh, and we say that uh, these two points are resolved if you get a big enough dip between them, so here it looks as though there's two points, uh, and uh, this is an example where the two points are so close together uh, that we say they're not resolved because you're not seeing a substantial dip in between there. Uh, and uh, so, so very often that's taken as a as a, a definition of, of whether um, a, a structure is resolved by the microscope. Um, now, so Rayleigh, he came up with this idea of two-point resolution, uh, actually with not anything to do with microscopes. Uh, it was to do with telescopes, and he was interested in the imaging uh, of stars, 
Uh, and uh, so you can see this diagram, uh, this picture I just showed you, uh, could be uh, the image of two stars uh, that are quite close together. Uh, and uh, he was trying to work out what the, um, the resolution of that telescope would be. Uh, and uh, so what he said was that the, um, the two points are just resolved uh, if the second point is placed on the first dark ring of the first. So uh, going back to this then. So you, you, this is one image of one point. So you place another point over where this dark ring is here. Uh, and uh, so that's what he de decided to take as the definition of when it's uh, resolved. Uh, and, uh, and when that occurs, uh, you, can ex you can say that the separation between the points in terms of this, uh, th this optical coordinate I mentioned is, is this um, 3.84, <coughs> like a sort of magic number, uh, and uh, which, um, uh, which is, um, that this is actually uh, 2 pi times this figure, uh, um, this is another sort of magic number, 1.22 is another one you often see in the books, which is twice that, so R0, um, I think the separation between the points is twice this, 1.22 uh, lambda over the numerator aperture. And um, so uh, what, 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 he, what, what you find then uh, is that uh, the ratio of the intensity midway between the points to the intensity at the points is then uh, this figure 0.735. Um, I'm just saying that, we'll come back to the, that in a minute, um, but the point um, I wanted to make now is that Rayleigh came up with this resolution criterion for stars, uh, and uh, so two stars are obviously, uh, they are, they're, there's no phase relationship between uh, the light that comes from two stars, right, so this, so this is what we call incoherent imaging. Uh, so. Uh, Rayleigh was looking at the properties of incoherent Im image formation, and we'll, we'll, we'll say a bit more of that in, about that in a minute. And uh, so this is showing what happens as you uh, change the separation uh, between the two points. This is, this is when the points are just resolved according to Rayleigh, uh, and this is if they're 10% closer, 20% closer, 10% further apart, 20% further apart. You see that the, the, actually the, the size of this dip you know, changes actually very quickly uh, over quite a small uh, range of distances. Uh, so it's a sort of catastrophic um, effect this, uh, the, the, when, when resolution suddenly disappears basically. Right? So, uh, so whether he chose it to be this or this or this, it doesn't really matter very much in terms of um, at, at the, the performance. Right, now, so I said about coherence. It turns out uh, that if you've got a microscope, um, here I'm talking about like a normal bright field microscope, not a fluorescence microscope. A bright field type microscope where you illuminate the sample with a condenser lens and then you look at the image with an objective lens. So it's, this is roughly what you've got. You've got a condenser of a certain aperture, you've got an objective of a certain aperture, uh, and um, you find that the imaging properties of that microscope uh, depend on the relative size of that condenser aperture relative to the uh, objective aperture. Uh, and uh, we describe that by a thing which is um, called the coherence ratio, uh, which is uh, given this symbol S, uh, and it's the ratio of the numerical aperture of the condenser lens to the numerical aperture of the objective lens. So you can see uh, that if you stop down the condenser, you make the aperture of this condenser very small, it's effectively as though you're illuminating with a single plane wave of light. Uh, so this becomes equivalent to what we call coherent illumination. It's as though all the points of the object are, are illuminated in phase with each other. Uh, and uh, on, the, on, on the contrary, if you make this objective, uh, the condenser aperture very big compared with the objective aperture, uh, it becomes incoherent, effectively. Uh, and um, Rayleigh knew this, actually. Is in one of his papers, he describes about how you, how you should get this uh, variation uh, between coherent and coherent incoherent as you change the aperture of the lens. 
Uh, and uh, now, of course, um, if this objective lens has got quite a big aperture itself, there's no way you can actually ever really get to something which is much bigger than that because uh, there's a limit to how big the solid angle of these lenses can be. Uh, and um, But anyway, very often uh, we're working in practice with a value around s equals 1, uh, which is an in-between case, it's basically partially coherent. Uh, it's not that different from being fully incoherent, but um, not quite the same. And this is sometimes called, um, oh, lots of different words, full, matched, or complete illumination, people use to describe this. Uh, and uh, very often you would use, in practice, uh, a, new, new, uh, a, um, a condenser aperture, which is around this figure, maybe slightly smaller than that, maybe slightly bigger than that. Uh, and uh, basically, slightly bigger than that, you get better resolution. Slightly smaller than that, you get better contrast. So it's a balance between these two things. Uh, and then I'll just mention, a lot of you would be uh, interested in fluorescence imaging. In fluorescence imaging, it's a bit like the stars. Uh, two fluorescent molecules are going to emit light independently of each other, and so there'll be no phase coherence between the emission from the two points. Right, so uh, fluorescence always behaves as incoherent imaging, whatever the size of the condenser lens or whatever that you're using. <coughs> right, so going back to the two-point resolution, uh, this is what um, uh, the image of your two points will look like uh, for three different cases here. Uh, a small condenser, i.e. the coherent case, a large condenser, which is the incoherent case, so this was the Rayleigh what Rayleigh, Rayleigh um, considered, uh, and this blue curve here, I've drawn here curves for four different separations in each case. The blue one in each case uh, is, for the, um, uh, it, it is for Rayleigh's condition, where this is just, uh, these are just resolved according to Rayleigh criterion. Uh, and you see um, straight away that the, co the coherent case here, those points are not resolved. Uh, so this is an important uh, thing, which has not been known for a very long time, uh, that um, if, you, uh, if you want to get the best resolution, you have to use something approaching uh, incoherent illumination rather than coherent illumination. Uh, and um, so this in-between case, this is with this S equals 1. Uh, you see that the blue curve actually turns out to be identical in these two cases. But the, 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 the other curves are different. They're, they're, they're not the same. Uh, this is not incoherent. It's partially coherent. And um, so, so this is another curve taken from Born and Wolf, uh, where he plots. This is this um, coherence ratio I mentioned. Uh, S equals 1 is when the two apertures are equal to each other. Uh, and uh, here he's plotting the, the separation between... Uh, the, the two points in order for this uh, uh, resolution uh, to be, well, um, sorry, I've missed something out really, actually. Uh, and that is that um, uh, if, 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 you're, if, if you've got a system where it's not incoherent, uh, then it, it's become conventional to take them as being resolved when the dip at the centre is still this figure of 0.735 that I mentioned earlier. Right, so if you define that as being the, um, the, um, when, uh, the resolution of the microscope effectively, uh, then you can plot this resolution against this factor S, uh, and you see that it, it decreases, the, set, the, the distance between the two points becomes smaller uh, for them to be resolved as you, uh, as you open up the condenser aperture. Right, so if you're a coherent system, they're further apart, they're not resolved, uh, and um, uh, the, the, for the Rayleigh, Rayleigh criterion here, they would not be resolved. Uh, and then as you open up the aperture, the separation for the, of the points for them to be resolved gets narrower and narrower. And it reaches a minimum uh, for a, a value of S of about 1.42. Okay, so uh, we can determine that. This is another way of plotting this. We plot this ratio of the, the intensity midway between the points to the intensity at the points. Uh, and we plot that as a function of the dis distance between the points 
Uh, and where this, these curves cross 0.735, uh, that's a, a measure of the resolution of the, of the system. Okay, so this is um, uh, what they call the generalised Rayleigh criterion there. The original Rayleigh criterion was, was for incoherent illumination. Uh, and the generalised Rayleigh criterion uh, is defined in terms of the ratio between the intensity at the points, the, the intensity midway between the points to the intensity at the points. Um, there is actually a, well, there are a few different other re resolution criteria that people uh, talk about in the literature. Um, there is actually a bit of a problem with this this, this one I, I've mentioned so far, the generalised Rayleigh criterion, and that is that, um, you know, to know what the, in, if you're doing an experiment, uh, to know what the intensity at the points is, you know, to, it, you have to know where the point is. Uh, and, uh, and you might not know that, unless you, if you don't know what the magnification of the system is accurately, you don't know that. So it's actually not a very good definition of resolution when it comes to actually uh, looking at uh, experimental data in some cases. Right, now, I'll say a bit more about um, how uh, an image is formed. Let's imagine then we've got a, an object which is basically just a semi-transparent screen and we illuminate it with light uh, and then the light that comes out the other side is going to have some variation in, in in modulus and phase. Uh, so we can write our object as being something like this. It's, it's, uh, th this is in general a complex quantity, the amplitude transmittance of the sample, uh, and we can write it in terms of a, a modulus term uh, and then a, a phase term, e to the i phi, both of these of course being functions of position. Um, if, we, if, if we had a perfect microscope uh, what you'd see is the modular square of this thing, the intensity. You know, the eye or a camera or anything is sensitive to intensity. So what you'd see is the modular square of that. What you'd see is this A squared, right? So what you'd see, you, uh, you, you, you could see the variations in this modulus, uh, the transmission, the, the, the absorption of the sample, uh, but you can't see the phase. The phase information has completely disappeared uh, by finding the by, by observing the intensity, uh, and uh, so I've made a note here: no phase information in a perfect image. Uh, so what that means is that if you want to see the phase, you you have to make the system imperfect in some way, uh, which it seems a bit strange first of all. But um, I'm going to talk a bit about that in I think the fourth of, of my lectures this morning. So um, now let's let's consider going back to this two-point situation again. Uh, let's consider the the, the, the co coherent case where these two points uh, they uh, they emit light uh, in with phase coherence between them. Uh, so what you're actually going to see in an image, uh, the amplitudes of the two points are going to add up in phase. Uh, and this is what I'm showing here. This is the amplitude of the one point. You see it goes negative um, here. Uh, and you add those two together and you get something like this. Uh, and, uh, and then what you actually see is the intensity. So the modular square of that, you see something like that. So this is the intensity image of these two points. Uh, they are actually drawn uh, for the uh, Rayleigh, uh, the separation between them is for the Rayleigh condition for if they were incoherent, but you can see, of course, they're not resolved in this case at all. So that's how we can calculate the image of any arbitrary object. Any arbitrary object, you can break it up into lots of points. Each of those points is going to image with this point spread function, amplitude point spread function. Uh, we add those all together, and then finally we find the modular square to find the intensity. Uh, and uh, mathematically, we can write like that pr this process like this. Uh, you've got uh, this is T, our object, the object's amplitude transmission. Uh, H is the amplitude point spread function. Uh, so this is a convolution. It's saying that for each point of this, you have one of these. Uh, and uh, and then this convolution, we find the modular square to find the intensity. 
Uh, so that's how we can calculate the image of any arbitrary object in a coherent system. And um, now, the other way of um, uh, comparing the uh, imaging performance of different systems is in terms of uh, uh, Fourier uh, analysis. So um, what we can do is any object, basically, here I'm showing it for a periodic function, a square wave object, uh, but uh, using Fourier transforms, you can, uh, you can apply this same method to any arbitrary object. It doesn't even have to be periodic. Uh, so what I'm showing here is that this square wave object, we can resolve it into its Fourier series. Uh, so you've got a constant term, a, a sine wave type term, a sine uh, three something term, so it's uh, the third harmonic. Uh, and uh, here I'm just, just showing what happens when you sum together those first three terms. You, you see that you're get, already getting quite a good approximation to the square wave. Right, so, uh, so this is another way of, uh, of, of uh, considering the resolution of the microscope. We look at how the microscope behaves uh, for these different um, sine waves of different periods. Uh, and um, so now this, this is very closely connected uh, with the whole area which is now known as Fourier optics. Uh, so Fourier optics has been around quite a long time now, but basically uh, what, what this shows uh, is that if you've got a lens and you've got some amplitude, a distance f in front of the lens, uh, what you get in, the, in, in this plane here, a distance f after the lens, uh, the amplitude here is just the Fourier transform of this. Uh, and um, here, here I'm showing it, uh, explaining that in a different way. Uh, basically, what the what the lens does, it it, uh, it transforms uh, positions to slopes and, and slopes to positions. So here I'm showing a point here. Uh, the light from this point is going to be collimated by the lens, right? So so the light from from a single point all now is at the same slope. It's got the same slope, uh, and um, the blue lines I've shown here. Uh, the lines, a collimated beam, when it goes into that lens, will be focused down to a spot, right? So all the light from, uh, with a particular slope uh, goes to a particular point. So this is explaining this uh, Fourier transforming property of the lens. Uh, and um, interestingly, I said that Fourier optics has been around, I don't know, what, 50 years or something like that. Uh, but actually, that concept really was understood by ABBA uh, in his uh, amazing paper, which was in 1873, I think. Uh, and uh, so he showed, uh, back in 1873, that what is actually happening in, as a, in a microscope is you're doing this Fourier transformation twice. Uh, so this is our microscope, this is the object, this is the image. Uh, and uh, the objective lens, the first lens here, uh, has the effect of producing the Fourier transform of this object. Uh, just like I described previously, so this is what it looks like. The object you get is, imagine this is a grating, uh, then these are basically the grating orders. So if I put in here the square wave object that I described, you would see uh, the DC term, the sine wave term, the third harmonic and so on, like this. Uh, and, um, uh, and then you see the second lens uh, gets this collimated light and focuses uh, and produces an image. Uh, and um, so if, if the lens was infinitely large, if you could collect all that light, uh, then effectively you would get a perfect image. But in practice, of course, you can't. Uh, and the lens is going to have some finite aperture. Uh, so this uh, I'm representing here by this aperture stop of the lens. Uh, and what that does is to get rid of some of these diffraction orders. So, for example, uh, that, for that case I just described, uh, imagine that the, this third harmonic gets through, but the fifth harmonic doesn't get through, then this is what the, uh, would, would, uh, the, the components that would contribute to the final image. Right, so ABBA come up with this idea way back, uh, but it's taken a very long time uh, to be fully appreciated that what, what it all really means. I think partly because nobody knew how to uh, deal with partially coherent systems. Uh, so what we do now then uh, to analyse things in terms of this uh, Fourier type method uh, 
First of all, we have to take the Fourier tra transform of our sample. So this is our, our object. We take its two-dimensional Fourier transform, which is given by this integral. This we call the object spectrum. Uh, and uh, so that is now going to be filtered uh, by the uh, uh, optical system, by the, what we call the transfer function of the system. So some of those spatial frequencies are going to get through and others are not going to get through. Uh, and um, so, so this is what happens. This is the object spectrum. Uh, this is the uh, image, is the object spectrum multiplied by the transfer function of the system. Uh, which basically, as I showed, for an a simple aperture is just either 0 or 1, according to whether the light gets through or doesn't get through. Uh, and, uh, and then what you actually see finally uh, is the modular square of this to get the intensity. Uh, uh, so, so you have to multiply, sorry, I've missed the stage out. Uh, this is the object spectrum. We multiply by the transfer function to get the spectrum of the image. Uh, we then have to do an inverse Fourier transform to get back into real space. So that's what this integral here does. And then we uh, do the, Fourier, the um, modular square to get the intensity. Right? So the spatial field, uh, frequencies are filtered uh, by this transfer function of the system, uh, which looks a bit like this. The light near the centre of the system gets through. The, 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 the uh, components outside here are outside the aperture of the lens and they don't get through. Uh, now, this, um, uh, it turns out this, this um, modular square here, you can actually write this modular square of an integral as being this <coughs> integral. So this is a double integral. Now we've got uh, four integrals, unfortunately. Uh, but um, th th this, this, is, uh, th this is equivalent to this. Uh, and uh, so now you can see that you've got this, uh, this transfer function this amplitude transfer function appearing twice here, uh, and uh, in a sort of separated form, the one multiplied by the other. It turns out that for the more complicated case of a partially coherent system, uh, this is still true. The, the, you've got this exact same relationship. The only difference is that this thing here doesn't separate into the product of two components. We have to think of this as being a single function of four variables. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to say a lot about um, this general case of uh, uh, partially coherent imaging because it's all rather complicated. But I shall touch on it a bit in the phase contrast <coughs> talk. Right, so the other extreme though is incoherent imaging, uh, where as we said, our two points now, uh, they emit light uh, where the phase is not, uh, doesn't have a... Uh, definite relationship between each, each other, so you have to then add together the intensities. You've got the intensity of the one point, the intensity of the other point, add them together, this gives you your final image. Uh, and uh, for many points you can do the same. You break up your arbitrary object into lots of points. Each of these is going to be imaged by this thing, which we call the intensity point spread function. Uh, and this uh, intensity point spread function is the modular square of the amplitude point spread function. Now beware, in lots of books, you just, you, they just talk about point spread function and they don't make it clear that what, whether it's an amplitude one or an intensity one. So you have to be a bit careful when you read books. Uh, and um, you can describe your, your, your objects in terms of also an intensity transmission, which is given the mod, by the modular square of T, that we had before, and then the image intensity is given by the convolution of these two quantities. Right, so this is this expression you see is a bit different uh, from what I described earlier for the coherent case. Now, for an incoherent system, it turns out you can uh, describe this also in terms of a transfer function, uh, which is called the optical transfer function. Uh, and, and it turns out that this um, optical transfer function uh, is actually calculated by looking at the autocorrelation of the lens pupil function. Now, what do I mean by that? Th this circle is the, is the edge of the aperture of the lens. Uh, and the autocorrelation of that, we have to look, look at the product of two of these. Well, actually, one is, uh, one is the um, 
a complex conjugate of the other. Uh, and we calculate, we shift one relative to the other, and we calculate the area of this overlap region. Uh, and if we do that, you can get an analytic expression for it. It looks like this. Uh, and if you plot it, it looks like this. Uh, this is sometimes called the Chinese hat function. Uh, and um, so you can see uh, that it decays like decays almost linearly to start with, and then with a bit of a kink, and then suddenly, it, eventually, they don't overlap at all. Uh, and this is a cross-section through this. Uh, and uh, now, one important thing here, another uh, important thing, is that you see that the cutoff here is 2. If the radius of this, of this lens aperture is 1, then when they're just touching, the, difference between, the distance between the centres is going to be 2. Uh, and uh, so that means uh, that uh, an incoherent system can see twice the spatial frequency uh, that a coherent system can see. Uh, so that to some degree explains this improved resolution that I described uh, that you would get uh, for the incoherent case as compared with the coherent case. So yeah, so these are the two transfer functions for the coherent case uh, the, the incoherent case, in a way, you shouldn't really be comparing the one with another because it's a, you know, a bit like apples and pears because uh, they operate on different things. This is operating on amplitudes and this is operating on, on intensities. But you can see the cutoff of this <coughs> is as big, uh, but it does, on the other hand, decay, whereas this one has got a flat top. And um, right now, so what happens if we defocus that system? Uh, the, um, it turns out uh, that now you've got to work out, uh, you've got to take into account the fact that this aperture has got some phase, right? And uh, so it's not just the area of overlap we've got to work out, it's a sort of weighted area taking into account uh, this uh, phase uh, effect. Uh, and uh, this was um, first calculated by uh, Harold Hopkins uh, back in 1955. And this is, uh, shows what happens to the OTF as you increase the amount of defocus. You see that, um, this is for the case with no defocus, you see that um, as, you, as you defocus the system, uh, these curves start dropping off, i.e. the response uh, for the uh, uh, defocused system to a, sp a particular spatial frequency uh, is going to be uh, reduced as you defocus it, which explains why it goes, gets blurred, basically. Uh, and um, now I'm not sure you, uh, you can see this very closely, but this is actually the origin of this plot. So this line here corresponds to a value of zero. Uh, and you see that here, these, these curves go below zero i.e. they go negative. Uh, and what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that if you have an object which is a sine wave, the image of it is going to be minus the sine wave, um, which um, is actually a very bad thing. Uh, if you think in terms of um, you know, Fourier series uh, for a particular object, if you make some of the terms negative with respect to the, other, uh, to the others, it's going to mess up the image, basically. Uh, so really, this is um, what really makes a, a defocused image look blurred compared with a, a, an in-focus image. Uh, and uh, so that was um, described by Hopkins. Uh, this is a simulation, actually, of this effect that was done by uh, one of my students when I was in Singapore, um, Shalin Mehta. Uh, and uh, actually, this is for the partially coherent case where you get... Um, where, where the condenser aperture has got the same aperture as the objective. Uh, and he's calculating the image of this, um, what's called a Zeeman star. Uh, and um, so this is the image when it's in focus. You see that eventually uh, you can see this quite clearly until at some point it just um, uh, loses resolution basically because these uh, uh, different spatial frequencies don't get through the optical system. Uh, and, uh, but if you, if you defocus it, you see you get quite a different effect. You notice that if you trace along these lines, suddenly what was, what was uh, black becomes bright, and what was bright becomes black. Right? So this is all caused by this um, change of sign of the 
optical transfer function. So you, you'd obviously expect that that is going to be, um, you know, a, a, a sign that your image is not going to be very good in general. Uh, another object that's very important is the is an edge object. Uh, so here, imagine you get your microscope and you put a razor blade in there. Uh, so you, you, the, a perfect image would be bright and then suddenly uh, become dark. Uh, but uh, actually what you see then is something like this. Uh, these are for two different values of this coherence parameter, uh, coherence ratio. Uh, and um, you find that um, uh, you see various things change. This one you see has got, when it's coherent, almost coherent, you get this strong fringing. Uh, the slope of this can change. Uh, and the value actually at the origin also changes. Uh, so all of these are important things. Uh, and uh, so this is a bit about these. This, this tells you what the slope is for different values of s. This is the intensity at the edge for different values of s. Uh, and um, uh, there's a very important point here, and that is if you're ever trying to measure something, it's like seriously important to know uh, where the edge is relative to where you think the edge is. Uh, and uh, because in, in general life, we're used to the fact, we, we're usually used to incoherent imaging. Uh, so um, we naturally think that the edge is going to be uh, where, uh, where, where the intensity is a half, i.e. going back to this figure before, we would tend to think of the uh, of the image of the um, edge as being here rather than here. See, so uh, if you don't take this into account, you get the wrong answer for the size of your cell or whatever you're trying to measure the size of. Okay, now, partially coherent image formation. Uh, you can see the, the maths in this gets horrible. Uh, so this was from another paper by Hopkins who first uh, really solved this problem. Uh, and he did it by, you see all these sums here, is, is um, finding the uh, Fourier series for his sample. Uh, and, uh, and he showed that you could uh, express the transfer function of this system, which he, he called the transmission cross coefficient, uh, in terms of the apertures of the, of the source and of, of the objective pupil. Um, I, I got involved with this quite a lot when I was, um, I used to be, I, for 15 years I was in Oxford in England uh, and uh, so at that time was when we were developing the confocal microscope and we were trying to understand how the confocal microscope compares with an ordinary microscope uh, and um, so this of course required us to understand how the ordinary microscope works so, uh, so we, we um, looked into this partially coherent image formation theory. Uh, and um, so, um, but in our case, we uh, were thinking of the, uh, in terms of the uh, Fourier transform of the object to rather generalize it from a, um, a periodic object. And th th this is what I showed earlier. For this general partially coherent case, uh, basically this thing is no longer a, a separate, separable product. Uh, and it turns out you calculate the transfer function uh, uh, by the um, area of overlap of not t two circles but now three circles. Uh, and um, again you can, you can get analytic expressions for these but they're pretty horrible. Uh, but you can calculate it. Uh, my student um, Shalin Mater, uh, when I was in Singapore, uh, so, uh, so he calculated these things. So this is what this, uh, this transmission cross coefficient looks like. And this basically gives you, uh, the it's like a transfer function for pairs of spatial frequencies. Because we're looking at intensity, um, basically you get the sums and differences of the, of the spatial frequencies appearing. Uh, and uh, so this is a, uh, a spatial frequency 1, spatial frequency 2, uh, and for different values of the pairs of those, uh, it will either get through the system with a certain strength or whatever. 
Uh, and uh, so, so this, this is what different systems look like as you change this parameter s. Uh, and um, actually, it turns out that you're, it, it becomes a bit nicer if you rotate the coordinates. Uh, and uh, so this is just describing this. You introduce what are called central and difference coordinates. So like if you've got two frequencies, one and two, uh, you look at the average of them and the difference between them. And that's that, that has the effect of rotating that diagram. So this is rotated now to be like this. Uh, and... Um, uh, you can see that now the symmetry is a bit more easy to cope with. And um, I, I should say a little bit more about this in the, in the final lecture when I get onto uh, phase contrast. But, but at the moment, well, I'm going I'm to simplify things again. But all that's rather complicated. It turns out that for the partially coherent case, uh, things become a lot simpler again for two special cases. And they're, they're important cases. Uh, one is when your object is very weak. Uh, so in this case, weak object, effectively what you're doing uh, is you're uh, neglecting, you know, when, you, when light is diffracted by an object, you get a, a, a direct beam and a diffracted beam, uh, and then these interfere with each other. Uh, and um, in general, if you've got a weak object, uh, the scattered light is quite weak, uh, and therefore, you can neglect the interference of the scattered light with the scattered light. Uh, and you just uh, keep the other turns. Uh, and um, you can use this if, you, if, if, um, if the Born approximation is, is satisfied. Uh, and so that's the weak object case. Uh, the other case is where your sample is slowly varying in space. Slowly varying uh, on a scale fixed by the uh, point spread function of the microscope. Uh, and uh, so this is what we call this slowly varying phase gradient case. Uh, and, uh, and we can apply this method uh, if this so-called Ritov approximation is valid. So this is another uh, approximation that people often use uh, to describe uh, propagation of light in, in uh, tissue or whatever. Uh, and um, so it turns out that uh, this weak object Transfer function case uh, is given by this thing. Uh, there's a zero there because uh, you only look at the interference of the scattered light with the direct light. Uh, and it turns out that for this other one, the slowly varying case, uh, the uh, we, you see this is now C of M M. It's the same M that appears both, and that's because uh, effectively there's only one spatial frequency there. So it can only interfere with itself. Uh, and um, so this is looking for two, uh, two cases, the coherent case uh, and the matched case, uh, for these two transfer functions. And you see that actually they're identical. Uh, so uh, it all becomes uh, much simpler uh, when, we, when, we, when we can make one of these two approximations. And you'll find that in the literature, very often people do make one of the or other of these two uh, approximations. Now I'm going to finish off with a bit about the, this weak object case. Uh, if you've got the weak object case, uh, then you can think of any arbitrary object as being e to the something, uh, and we can ex this b is now weak, so we can expand that like this by a binomial type expansion, uh, and um, and then the Fourier transform of this, we can work out very easily what the Fourier transform of this is. Uh, and, uh, and then stick that in and calculate what our sample is. Uh, and um, it turns out then, uh, this is the image you get. The real, the real part uh, of this um, object uh, times the transfer, the weak object transfer function. Uh, and if you've got a phase object, this B is going to be imaginary, or in general complex, but it's not going to be real. Uh, and this though, if you've got an ordinary, um, uh, imperfect system, uh, uh, an in-focus system, is going to be real. Uh, so the point is that this real part of this, you won't see the imaginary parts of this if that is real. 
Uh, which is why, you, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier about the fact you can't see the phase information. Uh, so the phase is imaged by the imaginary part of this. So you could, for, for example, see it by defocusing the system. Because we've shown that um, if you defocus the system, you introduce some phase. Um, so, so this is how you can do it. You can either, you can either make the pupil complex, uh, which you can do by uh, defocus, aberrations, Zernica phase contrast, or some other things. Or you can make it asymmetric, it turns out. Uh, and this is what you do in things like um, Namaski, uh, Schlier, and, and some other things. So uh, I'll talk about the, these, these methods in general in the fourth lecture. But I'll talk about defocus. Um, you know, Zernica got the, um, the Nobel Prize for inventing phase contrast. But years before that, people effectively were seeing the phase information by defocusing their microscope. You, you put your, um, you know, uh, uh, you might have some cells or something on a slide, uh, and um, if you're in focus, you see nothing, and as you go out of focus, then you start seeing the phase information. Uh, and um, so it's um, it based on the idea that you change the phase of, the, of different parts of the signal uh, relative to each other. Uh, and um, if, you, if your condenser aperture is too big, this fails. Uh, but uh, for a coherent system, all you've got effectively, the real and imaginary parts of your, uh, of your pupil are just given by uh, the real and imaginary parts of e to the i, i u rho squared effectively. So here we are, written it there. So, um, so um, it, they go like this. So here, here I'm drawing these. So this is the weak object transfer function uh, for different sizes of condenser lens. This is the real part. This is the imaginary part. So this is just like cosine of, of um, spatial frequency squared. This is like sine of spatial frequency squared. Uh, this is a very, this is making this S almost one. Uh, and you see these, these coefficients here are quite small. Uh, if that became one, this would just immediately this would go completely to zero, so you wouldn't get any phase contrast. Uh, but in between, you see that, it, that both of these are quite reasonably strong, uh, and you could use this curve, this 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 transfer function like this, uh, to image the phase information of your sample. Uh, and um, so that's what people have, have been doing for more than a hundred years. Uh, not quantitatively, but in order to visualise things. Uh, now, there's a horrible expression there, but that's basically what I've plotted here. So the, the, you can actually get closed form expressions for what these do. Uh, this is a picture of... Um, yeah, now, so if you, in, if you defocus one side or defocus the other side, all that happens is it inverts the contrast, the phase contrast. Uh, and the amplitude contrast is going to be the same. So if you do this subtraction, you defocus one way, defocus the other way, subtract. Uh, this is the um, uh, like the transfer function for the phase information for a weak object. Uh, and uh, so this is changing the value of s. You see there's an optimum value of s around 0.6, uh, which gives you the strongest of this phase information. Uh, and the other thing we notice is that here, this is, this is like a parabola, uh, a, a squared type behaviour. Uh, and uh, so this is a transfer function, so it's in Fourier space. Uh, and a, a, a parabola uh, in Fourier space is like a second derivative in real space. Uh, so that means that we can get rid of this parabola by, by effectively... Uh, doing an inverse Laplacian type operation. We do a bit of uh, signal processing, image processing, and we can make this parabola now flat. So after we've done this inverse Laplacian, we've now got a, uh, a, a uh, um, phase contrast transfer function. You can think of it as being flat top like this. Uh, and uh, so this is for different values of the coherence ratio. Uh, so, or, or you could, rather than doing this inverse Laplacian, you could do it, you know, more properly by doing some sort of inverse filter, like a Wiener filter. 
And uh, I think this is my, maybe the last slide of this talk. Uh, so this is an example of this where we did this experimentally. This is another of my students when I was in Singapore, uh, Shan Shan Ko, who's, who's now in Australia. Uh, and um, so um, here we're looking at an optical fibre, and this is the uh, optical, um, uh, showing the optical path through that optical fibre, uh, looking from the side. Uh, and uh, so this is the variation in the, um, the, the profile of the fibre. And the, 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 you see this blip in the middle, which uh, is a, um, often seen when, when people make when it's a sort of artifact of the fabrication of optical fibres, you get this blip. Uh, and um, and, and th this is an example where she's um, re recovered the, um, uh, the phase of the object using this, this, this weak object method. Uh, here there's a comparison with another method which is called the transport of intensity method. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in the fourth, fourth lecture. Uh, but so, so, uh, so that's an example where we're trying to measure the, the phase of your object. I think that's the end. Right, yeah, so that's uh, end of part one. Um, I've covered a lot of stuff. So, so what's our plan now? We have break for a few minutes while they get their breath, or certainly while I get my breath. Yeah, I think people maybe, uh, well, maybe we could have one or two questions yeah, and then questions. Uh, yeah. a little bit of uh, fresh air. Yeah. Um, I guess you haven't got to this point yet, maybe, but uh, you're talking about phase imaging there, and I'm just thinking of, if you're imaging, uh, let's say, a bunch of cells, yeah. and uh, you're relying presumably on refractive index changes to give you the contrast, is that right? Yeah. So so one thing that I often wonder about is, is uh, Let's say the wavelength of the light is, is 500 nanometers, and when we talk about scattering, we get a, a peak of scattering um, efficiency, let's say, at, at about half the wavelength. So this makes me think that the photon is interacting with the object, <laughs> is seeing about halfway a wavelength worth of the object. Um, but in cells, you know, you have you have a membrane that's about nine, you know, seven or eight nanometers or something like that. At what point does the phase interaction uh, or the phase contrast sort of, sort of break down, or does it just 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 get less? Yeah, less I think. I, um, yeah, uh, I, I think if um, if the if the like the um, information content of your of the different spatial frequencies in your sample was was constant, uh, you know, like in uh, white noise, uh, that would lead to all sorts of pro problems. But luckily, it seems that if you if you do look at the spectrum of the different spatial frequencies in, uh, in most objects, they decay. And uh, so, uh, uh, luckily, I guess there's, um, you know, the, we, we are able to image a lot of the useful information and uh, uh, the, by, the, by the cutoff, by the time we get to the cutoff of the microscope, uh, the um, the spatial frequency content of the sample has actually decayed quite appreciably. So I think um, that is an important point, actually. That uh, it's almost luck, really, that that works like that. Although, on the other hand, of course, it does mean that you, you you're not seeing that very fine structure, um, you know, very strongly in the final image. So, so you're getting some kind of volume averaged. Factor index over some uh, well, you are in, in any microscope. You're always seeing, uh, you know, you're seeing a, a sort of filtered view of the sample, aren't you? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so the, um, the, the there is going to be a tailing off of the of the imaging performance for for the higher spatial frequencies. Okay. Yeah, I didn't actually say what. Um, I, so my four lectures. This was lecture one. Uh, uh, actually, phase contrast is going to be lecture four. Uh, lecture two, which is the next one, is going to be on confocal and a bit about super resolution. Uh, and, uh, and lecture three is to do with uh, um, the focusing of light, how, how you can focus light to a very small spot, uh, which of course is important for um, things like confocal microscope and so on. So that's the breakdown, the way I've arranged the talks. Okay, any, any more questions?
this this with the face. I'm sure you know how an OCT works. So let's say that I create a cross section viscan and I place the focus in the middle of the viscan. Are you saying that above or the image is the blur? I'm sensitive to face and below or again the image is blur. I'm again seeing the face. Uh, yeah, I think that is going to be the, the case. Uh, ah, no, no, in, no, it's not in OCT really, is it? Because there, what you're looking at is the is the reflected light, and the strength of that reflected light comes from basically uh, a, 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 a longitudinal phase change. That could be a weak object in your technology. Could be weak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we should comply yeah. with the mathematics there. Uh, well, I think you, you, I think you have to think think in terms of three D to get the correct answer to that. But yeah, it, you're right. I mean, it, basically in OCT, what you're seeing, you you get a reflection from a change in refractive index, don't you? Uh, whereas here in in phase contrast, we're actually looking at a transverse change in in refractive index rather than a longitudinal one. Okay, so uh, we can open those doors at the front and at the back here and people can get some fresh air and... Uh